Welcome back to CCCS 214 Object Oriented Programming 2 and today we continue with multi-threading. Uh, so last time uh, we were looking at locks and uh, I'm going to continue with uh, a look at locks to facilitate synchronization between uh, cooperation between threads. Uh, so uh, following up on locks, uh, the lock uh, class uh, the, uh, 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 or, uh, uh, has a method uh, called new condition. Um, if you call the new condition method on a lock object, uh, that is going to create a new kind of object called a condition object. Uh, and uh, you can use we can use that condition object to uh, to, to achieve cooperation between threads. Uh, and there are three principal methods that we are interested in. There's the await method uh, that is called in a part of the code uh, where we want to wait for something else to happen in another thread. And uh, that second thread can uh, signal that it is ready or has reached a certain point uh, uh, in its execution using either the signal method or the signal all method. So three methods, await, signal, and signal all. So you can think of signal and signal all as a kind of a nudge, just a simple uh, indication uh, uh, telling the waiting uh, thread to, to move on. Uh, here's a simple graphical explanation that includes a little bit of code that explains how two threads communicate using conditions. Uh, so over here we have uh, two, two tasks, two executing in two threads uh, for the same application. And this example builds on uh, uh, an example we will we'll look at right now. Uh, also, uh, we did a similar example of an account a little earlier. So in here we have, uh, we, we, we using a lock object, we create a new condition that we call new deposit uh, that will indicate when more money has been added to an account, to a bank account. Uh, now in here we have two threads. Uh, one thread is withdrawing money and the other one is depositing money. Now obviously it may happen uh, in a bank account where you're trying to withdraw money out of an account that doesn't have enough funds. And that is a situation at uh, this is a, that's the time when uh, it becomes necessary for the withdrawal task to wait. It has to wait for a new deposit to happen before it can uh, withdraw anything from the account. So uh, we see over here uh, the await method is so uh, uh, here in the withdrawal task uh, calling the await method on this new deposit uh, condition object and uh, uh, when if if the code reaches this line uh, what that means is that execution of this thread will uh, will pause. Uh, meanwhile, uh, in the deposit task, um, if a new deposit, if a new deposit is made to the balance to the to, to the account, uh, that is followed by a call to the signal all method. Now, I said we have a signal method and a signal all method. Uh, sometimes you can have multiple threads waiting on one thread. Uh, in that case, signal all can be. Uh, it's usually what uh, the method that uh, we use sends out a signal to all waiting threads that hey I'm uh, I, I've reached I, I've, I've reached this particular point in in, in the code uh, so in this case uh, uh, when a new when more money is added to the account to the balance variable uh, that is followed up by a call to the signal all method of the um, uh, of the new deposit uh, condition uh, so let's take a look at the code for this example. Uh, this is what we're going to make. Uh, this is what the output is basically going to look like. Uh, so 
as an example. I'll switch to the code view in a minute. Let me just explain what this example is about a little more detail. So um, we have two threads. One puts money in the account. The other one takes money out of the account. Uh, the second thread that takes money out has to wait uh, if the amount in, uh, uh, in the account is less than what it's trying to withdraw. Um, whenever more funds are added to the account, the first thread, the one that is doing the depositing, that adds money, um, it will send, a, it will notify all, in this case the second thread, uh, that it can check and try to uh, uh, withdraw funds. Uh, if the amount of funds is still not enough, uh, the second thread has to continue to wait for even more money to come in. Uh, initial balance in the account in the, in, in, it will be zero um, and uh, uh, both the amounts that are added into the account and withdrawn from the account are both randomly generated numbers. So here's the code uh, for this example like uh, one of the one, some of the previous examples this example too uses embedded classes okay so we'll see that in a minute uh, so the uh, uh, the main class uh, containing the test program, the main method is the class thread cooperation. Uh, among member variables, it has an in, an object of type account, and account is one of the embedded classes uh, in this example that we'll see. Uh, the other one is uh, this class called deposit task. So this the deposit class, as you can see, implements runnable, which means this is this is going to become one of the threads, uh, the one that does the uh, depositing, the putting money into the account, the second thread. So it has a run method, and um, what it does is it basically generates a random number between 0 and 11, I guess. Uh, and uh, adds that money into the account by calling the deposit method. And then it goes to sleep for 1000 milliseconds, meaning for one second. So that's one thread. And all of this is happening inside a while true or while one loop, meaning this thread will keep running forever until unless we kill the program which is how we'll end this program um, then we have the second task the one that is trying to take money out of the account the withdraw task class also running as a thread so also implements runnable and contains only one method run it's running as a thread um, this calls a method on the account class called withdraw so this is just subtracting money uh, this uh, the amount that is subtracted is also an integer amount a random number between 0 and 11 and let's take a look at the account class this, as you can see we, we're using we have a withdraw method in here which means this account class is different from the account class in previous examples so we made, made some changes here so uh, the account class contains a lock We've used that before Uh, we create the condition new deposit right here as a member variable of the account class. See, new deposit is a condition and it is created using the new condition, calling the new condition method on the lock object that we have right up here. Initial balance is initialized, will be zero get balance lets you check how much is in the account the withdraw method and the deposit method are the interesting parts that we're really interested in uh, before I go into those let me just quickly uh, show you what what's happening in the main method um, so in the main method we have an executor service we create a pool of only two threads one thread 
will be the deposit task thread and the other one will be the withdraw task and that's it we call shutdown in the at the end and that's it so back to the account class so account class we create a lock condition integer member variable balance initialized to zero the get balance method and so let's talk about uh, the withdraw and deposit methods so in the withdraw method um, remember uh, before making any changes whether it is addition or re uh, subtraction to the balance member variable uh, we acquire the lock and in here we have a while loop in the withdraw method so while the balance is less than the amount that's when we have to wait right there's not enough money in the account so and the amount is passed here as an argument we saw that before uh, so as long as we don't have enough money wait um, once you come out of this uh, out of this loop meaning once you have enough in the account come out subtract the amount from the balance and print out how much you have left so amount withdraw mm -hmm, amount and you've got, got you'll have this much left uh, and we're using uh, exception handling so we have a catch block over here uh, print stack trace prints out it's, it's debug information and finally uh, we also have to call the unlock method to uh, in the finally block to make sure that even if something goes wrong in the try block uh, the lock ends up being released so we don't get our two threads don't get stuck deadlocked in a deadlock position uh, then we have the deposit method this too modifies the balance so it too has to acquire a lock uh, now uh, the deposit method doesn't care how much is already in the account so it doesn't have to this is uh, it doesn't have to uh, check for any condition as such once it has the lock so once we do have the lock balance is updated we add the amount passed as argument we add that to balance and we print out uh, how much was added and what the new balance is and after doing that we call the signal all method over here on the new deposit object and finally uh, we release the lock calling the unlock method in the finally block okay so that is all um, so among uh, one more thing that I'd like to add um, among the embedded methods uh, embedded classes that we have uh, deposit task withdraw task account class note that uh, in order for them to be embedded they all also have to be declared static We embed classes, we put classes, we can put classes inside of other classes when uh, the classes that we're embedding are so, have such a specific purpose that they'll only be used for the project that we're working on. Um, so let me switch over to NetBeans. So uh, this is the thread cooperation project um, I'll also show you something else that you can do mm. that means also has this navigator tab uh, you can keep that and the projects tab open at the same time by just dragging it down here uh, up here you have the uh, all the projects that you have in your uh, NetBeans ID projects folder and that'll tell you how many files, show you how many files you have, etc. This down here shows you, uh, gives you a code view of the code that you have. So we have uh, this icon here is for a class. So we have the thread cooperation class. Inside it, embedded in it, is the account class. 
the deposit task class and the withdraw task class. And um, these icons over here, they stand for uh, methods. So the account class, you can easily uh, see what methods uh, are in which class. Um, has a has a lock on this, uh, an integer member variable called balance, and it is its visibility is set to private. Uh, we have a lock of class lock, uh, an object lock of class lock with a capital L, also set private, and we have a condition uh, called new deposit, also private, all member variables of the account class. The deposit task and withdraw task classes both have just, uh, they, they, uh, they implement the runnable interfaces and they have a run method each. So you can see it gives you a good overview of what's in your code. Uh, also, the thread cooperation class has a main method and uh, a member variable uh, account object of uh, class account with a capital A. Okay, so let me run this and let's see what the output is for this code. So remember we put in a sleep timer of one second so that's why we're seeing this output display so nicely um, such uh, uh, at intervals of time that where you can actually see what's happening what's going on and to stop this uh, this will keep running forever two threads one making deposits, the other one making withdrawals. So let me stop this here. Now, in addition to conditions, uh, there's uh, older Java code. Um, so locks and conditions uh, came in in Java 5. Uh, before that, uh, there was another mechanism for thread co communication and cooperation uh, called monitors, which were kind of built into classes. Um, might, if you ever have to work with legacy code, older code, uh, you might enc encounter monitors. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to do an example for monitors, but what you need to know is uh, in conditions we had the await method, notify and notify, uh, signal and signal all methods. Uh, Java monitor methods uh, have similar names. Uh, they, instead of await, the method for monitors is called wait without the A in front of it. And instead of signal and signal all, Java monitors have the notify and notify all methods. Um, functions, purpose is uh, actually very, very similar. And uh, this is some example code um, shows you how you can use that. Works quite similarly, but the uh, thing is you have to use the wait, notify, notify all uh, uh, methods inside of uh, synchronized uh, 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 code blocks or, 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 or synchronized methods. So I want to give you one more example of uh, using conditions. Uh, this one's uh, uh, you know, this, this, this one describes a very common setup uh, where you have one thread that is uh, kind of producing data that another thread is using or processing for some something. Um, so, uh, if you think about it, if you have two tasks uh, to do uh, and you have only one thread or one piece of code doing both tasks, uh, it'll do it at a certain speed. But if you could split up the job, uh, where you can have the first half, one half done by one thread, and the second part of that job by another thread, um, you can probably speed things up significantly. Um, in that case, you have two threads that need to pass, in which one thread has to pass data to the other. Uh, the first thread, the one that does the first half of the processing, um, has, to, has to pass data to the second thread. Uh, that is a 
producer-consumer relationship uh, between those threads. Uh, and uh, the data that you, that you pass, that one thread passes to the other, can be passed uh, because sometimes one of the two threads uh, may uh, speed up, uh, may slow down, which means sometimes they, there may be more than just, uh, uh, there may be more jo jobs piling up for the second thread. Uh, sometimes the first, second thread may finish all of its assigned jobs and may just be waiting for the first thread. So this uh, synchronization uh, is needs to be taken care of and can do that by putting a queue or a buffer in between these two threads where one thread puts uh, data, puts items into the buffer and uh, into, into the queue and the second thread takes them out of the, or dequeues them, takes them out of the uh, queue. So that's, that's what we're going to do, but instead of doing anything complicated, uh, we'll have uh, one thread that is simply adding integers uh, to, in, into that buffer, into that queue, and the other one just takes them out. Uh, now, uh, th those integers could be other things, could be, could be objects, uh, could be much more complicated data, could be video data, for example, if uh, video processing is uh, qu quite compute, can be quite compute intensive. Um, where you have frames of videos uh, uh, being put into a buffer and being dequeued by the other thread. Uh, so uh, think of, you can think of it in, in, in those terms. So just passing integers from one thread to the other might not seem too exciting, but uh, the same concept basically applies. So what, what, what we'll have here is one, uh, one thread, uh, and this being depicted in this figure, we have one thread that is adding integers into that buffer. And uh, when it does that, first has to check if the buffer maybe is already full. And if it is already full, uh, the thread does, that does the, uh, that enqueues, that adds item into the buffer has to wait. Um, and when it adds something into the buffer, uh, and let me jump to the other thread. The other thread, the one, the consumer, thread that takes items, integers in this case, out of the buffer. Um, before it does that, it first has to check if the queue is already empty or not. And if it is already empty, then that thread has to wait. Uh, so either thread might have to wait. So remember in the previous example, we had uh, only one of the two threads might see a condition, the one that was withdrawal, uh, making the withdrawals from the account. That was a thread that might have to wait. But in this case, either of the, of the two, the producer thread or, or the consumer, uh, might face a condition where it might have to wait. Uh, so the thread that uh, adds items into the buffer, uh, after it does add an item into the buffer, it will, sig it will, it will call uh, the, uh, the, the signal method on a condition called not empty. If it adds something into the buffer, means there's at least one item in there. So uh, we know that the buffer is not empty, and that's what we're going to call our condition. Uh, on the other side, on the consumer thread side, uh, if uh, uh, if that thread removes an item from the buffer, then we know that there's space for at least one item in the queue in the buffer which means it is not full anymore. So after the, the consumer thread deletes an item from, or removes an item from the buffer, it will call the signal method on a, a, another condition called not full. So uh, let me jump to the code for this. Let's go through this. So we're going to use uh, locks and conditions again. Uh, and we have a similar setup in some sense. Uh, so this example is called consumer producer. So we have this class consumer producer with a main method in it. We have two threads, uh, an executor pool uh, of size two. And we have a producer task and a consumer task. Those are the 
two threads will be running and uh, uh, we have what we call shutdown at the end. Um, this consumer producer class has one member variable called buffer, which is an object of a class buffer with a capital B. And uh, this buffer class is also uh, made by us, so we'll, we'll come to that in the end. Uh, so the buffer is basically uh, is basically a, a, a FIFO queue. So let's talk about the producer task class first. This is an embedded class in the producer consumer class. It implements a runnable, so this is because this is being run as a thread. Uh, so it contains only one member method run. Uh, it has a try block and uh, has an integer i even one over here. Uh, that it's basically so the integers that we're adding into the queue. There'll be numbers starting from one, two, three. Uh, integers starting from one. The next number that we'll add will be a two, three, four, five, and so on. Uh, so we. Uh, print out the value of i to the screen, so producer writes i, uh, and we call the write method, so we'll get to that method, we call the write method for the buffer uh, object, and we, after we do that, we add, uh, we add 1 to the value of i, so initially i is equal to 1, so after we send a 1 uh, to the write method of buffer, uh, i becomes 2 because uh, we do a post increment over here. And uh, just to slow things down a little bit uh, so we can see what's happening on the screen, uh, we call the sleep method uh, uh, for a random uh, period of time. Uh, and that's it. And in the catch block, we just call the print stack trace method for if something goes wrong for debugging purposes. And uh, that's the end of the catch block, the end of the run method, and the end of the uh, uh, producer task class over here on this line. Uh, then we have the, the other, uh, the, the consumer thread, which is implemented in a class called consumer task, which implements runnable because it's also being run as the second, as a, as a thread contains one method called run and uh, we have the try block over here uh, so this also runs until infinity so this keeps reading uh, so, so okay so it prints out the so consumer reads and then we call the read method on buffer and whatever we get back we print that out to screen and after that this thread too goes to sleep for a while. You can think of the going to sleep part as um, uh, if the data was something more complicated than an integer, you can think of it as the time it is taking the program to, to process uh, the data, uh, the thread to process the data that it is receiving through the buffer. And we have a catch block, again, similar setup. Uh, this is the end of the catch block, this is the end of the run method, and this is the end of this embedded consumer task class. And now we come to uh, kind of the real part. Uh, this is the buffer class. And uh, we, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, build on uh, uh, the linked list class uh, that we get in Java. And we're going to use that for integers. Uh, we're going to call the member, uh, the, 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 the linked list object, we're going to call that Q. And uh, we're setting its capacity to one, meaning that the size of the queue is going to be, uh, we're going to set that to one. There's a, we're only going to allow there to be uh, one element in this queue uh, at the most. We create a lock object, just like before, a re-entrant lock, and we create two conditions uh, because uh, uh, we have uh, we need to know when the queue, or when 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 this uh, when the buffer, when it is not empty, 
and when it is not full. Okay, two conditions. So then we have the write method. The write, the write method, we pass uh, an integer value, um, acquire a lock, a try block, and while, uh, so the size is a method of, the, uh, of Java's linked list class. Uh, so this, uh, uh, we set uh, the, the size of the queue to one capacity is being set to it contains a value one at this point. Um, print out wait for not full condition, and uh, then we so remember this is the write uh, method. Uh, if you're trying to write something into, into the queue, you have to make sure the queue is not already full, and uh, so we wait for the not full condition. Okay. Uh, once that is, uh, once that condition uh, becomes true, uh, we write uh, whatever value we received here as an argument. We add that into the queue using the offer method, and uh, when we write something into the queue, we call the we 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 signal the not empty condition. For the other thread, and then we have a catch block, and in the finally block, we call the unlock method on the lock to make sure the lock always gets released, even if we see a condition. And finally, we have the corresponding read method, which is going to read elements from the queue and return them. Uh, initial value is zero. Acquire the lock, and in the try block. Wait for um, check if it's empty. Uh, if uh, if if the queue is indeed empty, uh, we wait for the not empty condition to become true. So we call the await method for on the not empty condition. Uh, once that becomes true, we break out of this while loop because is empty will become false, which means we get to this line and we remove the element from the queue and store it in value and which means that the queue is not full anymore, which means we can signal the not full condition. And then we have catch block and in the finally block we unlock the lock again and remember this read method also sends back returns uh, the element the integer we read from the queue so we return value it's the end of the finally block the end of the uh, end of the read method end of the buffer class and this over here is the end of the uh, consumer producer class in which all of these other classes are embedded. So this is the same uh, project, same consumer producer uh, class code uh, imported into NetBeans. Um, again, uh, take a look at, uh, uh, at the navigator view so consumer producer class with a main method containing an object of type of class buffer uh, and embedded in the consumer producer class is the buff buffer class with a read uh, and write method with read and write methods uh, an integer variable called capacity uh, a lock object of type of cl class lock two conditions called not empty and not full and uh, an object of the linked list class that comes with the Java API, an object called Q. Uh, also the consumer task and producer task uh, classes, both implementing the runnable interface, which means both have their own run methods. Okay, so this is the exact same code, copied and pasted, 
and uh, just showing you the code in uh, the browser window over there because it's a little more readable okay so let me run this now remember we have uh, quite long random waits between uh, producer and consumer checking the status of the queue Producer writes a 1, consumer reads a 1, producer writes a 2, producer wants to write a 2 but uh, has to wait for not full condition. So then after a while, consumer comes back, reads a 2, producer writes 4, consumer is still reading the 3, then reading the 4 and so on. stop this here now this uh, just to complete the discussion of uh, 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 producer consumer threads uh, the situation where you have one thread producing data the other one uh, consuming it for some reason uh, is quite common uh, a simpler way of achieving the same thing without getting into the, these nitty-gritties of uh, conditions and, uh, and, and locks uh, and thread co-cooperation co is using something called a blocking queue. Uh, blocking queue is an interface uh, which in turn implements the queue interface in Java which in turn implements something called the collection interface. Uh, a blocking queue is basically a queue uh, uh, that prevents those two problems that we have been dealing with ourselves in the previous example. Uh, meaning, uh, in a blocking queue, you cannot add, try to add elements to a queue if it's already full, and you cannot remove elements from a queue if it's already empty. And the blocking queue is only one example of the queues that are available to you in Java. Uh, in addition to the uh, array blocking queue, there's a, a, a linked blocking queue, uh, which is basically a different implementation of, uh, of a queue uh, uh, using a linked list. Uh, so the array blocking queue is implemented using an array. Uh, and uh, then we have something called a priority blocking queue. So uh, when you take a course in data structures, maybe uh, you'll learn about uh, priority queues. Uh, we'll get to that then. Uh, the main difference between the array blocking queue and the linked, uh, linked blocking queue is that the array blocking queue's capacity has to be, uh, uh, has to be decided in the beginning when you create uh, the object. Uh, and it doesn't change after that, just like arrays. Uh, but as you know, linked lists can take on any size. Uh, so uh, a linked blocking queue uh, can be bounded. You can limit its size, uh, but you can also leave it uh, unlimited. Um, a, a priority blocking queue can be both bounded uh, or unbounded, limited or unlimited in size. Um, uh, but there's some different. It's, it's not. It's not a FIFO queue. Uh, so basically, jobs or I items are, are given higher priority levels. Uh, get to jump ahead in in, in the queue. Uh, that's basically a priority queue. Uh, so let me jump to the code for uh, an, an an example of that. This example, the project is called Consumer Producer using blocking queue. So it's basically the same example that we just did, uh, but uh, using this, uh, 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 using Java's uh, array blocking queue. And uh, we're going to use uh, integers again, of course, and uh, so we have this class with this very long name, Consumer Producer using blocking queue. Uh, it has as its member variable uh, an object of array blocking queue type uh, for integers called buffer and 
as you can see over here we're passing the integer value 2 in the constructor which means we're limiting the size of this queue uh, to 2 and the main method looks again very similar we have an we create a, a thread pool of two threads and the first thread is the producer thread and the second one the consumer thread and that's all there is to the main method and embedded inside this um, consumer producer using blocking queue class are again two classes uh, we don't we, we're not defining our own buffer class like last time uh, because we're using uh, and because we don't have to add any functionality to it like we did in the previous example uh, we are just using uh, the object provided by the class provided by Java uh, which means we have only two embedded classes here one for uh, the producer thread implements runnable uh, so producer task implements runnable has only the run method and uh, we'll, similarly we have, we'll have the consumer task class which also implements runnable so let me start with the producer task class has a run method with the try block uh, initially I the number that would uh, the, the, uh, is initialized to one over here and we have uh, uh, an infinite while loop over here again first we print the value of i to screen nothing interesting and then we simply call this put method on uh, the buffer object uh, which is basically the same as enqueuing adding an element to the buffer and we do a post increment of i we add a, a, and to that. Now, notice that um, we're not using any locks. We're not using any conditions over here, uh, and it is not. And that's not. And, and right after adding an element into the buffer, you just go to sleep and you start the whole thing again. So none of that, uh, none of the uh, uh, over uh, code overhead that we've seen so far, because all of that is being taken care of by the Java's own array blocking queue. Uh, 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 a class over here so none of that as you can see uh, no calls to signal or signal all no, no await methods no locks no conditions and the consumer task is also uh, simple significantly simplified uh, just like the producer task class uh, again, also implements runnable, has only a run method, has a try block, and with an infinite while loop, and it to prints, it, it, it simply calls buffer.take. Take does the same thing. It, it's basically the DQ method to remove elements from buffer, uh, f uh, and uh, uh, it reads elements uh, from buffer, prints them out, and goes to sleep. And that's it. Two, really, only two lines of code inside this infinite while loop. The rest is just the catch block. And you can see no finally block because we're not see, we're not using any lock ourselves. All of that again is taken care of by the array blocking queue class in Java. Now that's three examples, uh, three example projects uh, that we looked at. Um, let me just quickly jump to the code for this you can see over here in the navigator view one class with the consumer producer using blocking queue main method buffer object uh, and then these two embedded classes for the two threads and let me just run this and see it looks the output looks uh, almost indistinguishable from the one uh, it is indistinguishable from the previous example does the exact same thing. Okay, so uh, three examples. That's I know that's uh, uh, it's a bit much for a single lecture, but uh, let me just uh, talk about um, one more thing uh, called uh, a related concept called semaphores. Uh, it can also be used to control. Um, who gets access to which thread gets access to which shared resources um, so uh, semaphores uh, can be thought of as uh, 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 
uh, so, uh, so semaphores basically hand out or give out issue permits permission uh, allows access uh, to code to to access certain resources um, I'm not going to do an example of that, but I just want you to know that this too exists in Java. Um, and uh, you, uh, uh, you can acquire and you can release these permits from a semaphore. Uh, a resource can have uh, uh, more than one permit, uh, meaning that, as you can see in the constructor over here, number of permits. There's an integer that can be passed to it in the constructor. Uh, so basically, sometimes we have a shared resource uh, for which it is okay that it can be accessed by two or three different threads at a time. So you can, you can control that. Uh, remember that so far, uh, when you declare anything, a critical section of your code, uh, only one thread can access that part of the code. Uh, now, if uh, the situation or the resources is, is one uh, that can actually be where it is actually okay for multiple threads to, but a limited number, to access the same resource, you may be slowing down your code unnecessarily. In that case, that may be a situation uh, better suited uh, uh, by uh, uh, for, for, for the use of semaphores. Uh, but one thing that might happen is, uh, uh, let's say there are you need a certain job requires that you rec uh, secure uh, semaphore or permits to two different objects. And let's say you have one thread, thread one over here, first uh, accesses or gets a semaphore to an object one, that's one resource, and then it uh, uh, attempts to get access to a, a permit for, uh, for an, from another semaphore for object two. Um, then we have another thread. It also needs the same two resources to do its job, but it's a different di different thread, different code, and a uh, different part of the uh, of that code. And it first uh, asks for access to uh, to a permit for uh, uh, from a semaphore for object two, then uh, tries to get uh, a, a permit for object one. Now this is a situation in which uh, maybe um, Thread 1 gets uh, this, uh, permit for object 1, thread 2 gets a permit for object 2, and then both of them might be stuck waiting for each other to release uh, 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 the, the others or, or other or, uh, its, its permit so it can proceed. Uh, so this is a deadlock situation uh, where your program might just get, st get stuck. But the solution to that is actually quite simple. Uh, you assign an order on all objects. Uh, so uh, 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 permits from semaphores to those objects, to those re shared resources, have to be acquired in a certain order. So always object one first, object two second, object three third, for example. And you, you maintain that order across all threads. And that will, uh, it's a simple solution to prevent uh, deadlocks of this kind.